Hi, and welcome to the Sunday Lunch Project Manager podcast for Sunday, the 10th of July. And this week, we've got Dr. Troy, the talent retention expert. This episode, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome on a new sponsor to the show. Um, The sponsor is a company called Tamplo, who offer a cloud-based service, um, an application which uh, turns meetings into action plans. Their two strengths that they highlight are it's dealing with meetings, it gives structure to meetings and meaning to meetings. Uh, It gives a clear agenda. Uh, with meeting perimeters to stick to the plan, shared agenda where invitees can be uh, add information and be fully prepared for the session. Uh, Leading the meetings by going through each item um, and using the tooling to do all that while capturing your minutes all at the same time, send it to uh, all of your attendees. Uh, The meetings are shorter, more enjoyable, which all of us want to get away from all the long, unuseful meetings that we have, Um, get more collaboration and sticking to the agenda too Uh, and in theory no one leaves the meeting uh, without knowing who is in charge of what and who's got to do what uh, specifically useful in recurrent meetings um, which have agendas that uh, are repeated the other great strength of it is around the project and task management and then following up Um, there's a clear dashboard of people's tasks they've got to do there's integration with uh, existing tools as well so if you want to use uh, that to integrate with uh, your current tooling you can do so Or you can use the tool itself and use that as for driving your projects, your departmental um, or uh, or just individual tasks. Um, I've started using it a little bit at home um, uh, to play with uh, with that. And I like nice, clean, simple interface, very straightforward setup, very straightforward to use. Um, The idea is to leave no task left undone, create more efficiency and motivation um, and also clear action plans for everything. Uh, it's easy, it's intuitive uh, to get work done with more peace of mind, more efficiency and more collaboration. So obviously with my latest view on productivity and focus on that, um, I can hardly recommend using a tool like this. Um, I get a kickback on this, obviously, um, you know uh, the situation and how it all works. So if you either jump in the show notes or pop along to uh, put this URL into your website, tinyurl.com slash Nigel Creaser Tamplo. All one words, Nigel Creaser Tamplo, uh, C-R-E-A-S-E-R, and Tamplo is spelled T-A-M-P-L-O. Let me know how you get on. And uh, thank you, Tamplo, for your support. Well, hello. So, what's been going on with me in the past uh, couple of weeks? Um, well, to be, from a podcast point of view, I managed to get three interviews in the back in the last couple of weeks, and I've got an absolute load of them up and coming as well. So, um, podcast guests uh, are. are uh, here basically. Um, as I mentioned previously, I think from uh, September onwards we're going to go weekly. Uh, so we'll add these uh, sessions, these uh, interviews will now be uh, still split into two, but then one a week. Um, because I've, once I've interviewed everyone that's on my list at the minute, I think I'm somewhere like, I think it's the end of October or maybe like later than that um, when I start needing new guests. And I know I've got some more coming, so it's great news. Um, so that's. Uh, fantastic news on the podcast um some of you may or may not look at my website i've been having a little bit of an overhaul trying to bring it back onto the yellow and black branding which has been a challenge and a little bit of html being learned by me there uh, which is uh interesting and frustrating all in one go so uh hopefully that'll be better i've, I've managed to create myself a i created a link tree for the the um, different podcast services for people, easier place for people to go and subscribe to. So, and then I found that I don't want, having learned stuff about SEO, I don't really want people jumping off to there. They want them jumping onto my website. So there we go. Let's see what happens with that. Um, so that's uh, all, all new, learning new stuff, which is always fun. I've also, um, some of may have seen on LinkedIn or on TikTok, 
um, because I think it's the only places I've put them at the moment. I've done a little video um, just really showcasing the amazing guests that have been on the show. Um, I'm going to do some more of this as well, maybe pick out some more of the excerpts and, and some stuff like that. But I've had over, I can't remember what the exact number is now that I've put out. Sort of, obviously, it's increasing every couple of weeks. Um, but so, well over 45 people now that I've had on the show since the beginning of 2019, which is fantastic when I look back at it. And I think I've had an hour's worth of education from them. And um, some of you out there may have listened to all of them, some of you may not. But there's. Um, approximately an hour's worth of education from each of those um, leaders in the field and project management. So if you haven't gone back and had a look, um, have a look at some of the the, uh, the, uh, the interviews from back in 2019, 2020. There's some fantastic conversations that we've had there. Um, and 2021, 2022, where we are now, and there's more to come. So um, I do urge you to jump along there. And I've said before, I kind of, it only dawned on me recently, I've got this little mastermind group mastermind mastermind group that are giving me an hour of their time teaching me what they know um and, and i'm getting all these lessons for free and um, i'm just i'm just humbled and, and uh, elated to get it because I've, I've used a lot of the things i've got things stuck on my wall that have come from the conversations um so i think uh, that's it really um there's not a great deal else to talk about at this point in time. So I'm going to leave you to have a listen to my first part of the interview with Dr. Troy and looking and talking about talent retention. So enjoy. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Troy. Dr. Troy Hall is transforming organizations through talent retention. He's featured on the Today Show, ABC, Beyond the, the Business Radio Show and CEO World. Dr. Troy is an award-winning strategist, radio show host, speaker, author, and talent retention expert. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Troy. Well, thank you, Nigel. Good to be here. Yes, brilliant. So tell us a little bit about you. Where, you. where are you from? Obviously, from your accent, some people will guess where you might have uh, grown up, but maybe not where you are. Well, I grew up in a small town in uh, West Virginia. Um, so I came from a very poor family there and had uh, opportunities because my mom and dad suggested that um, you can be what you want to be, but you need to focus on what that is and be the best at it. And so it really provided me an opportunity. And I have just worked in business for about 45 years, uh, last 26 years, C-suite. I run my own company. I do uh, what I do is I help guide leaders to retain their talent by infusing cohesion into their culture so they can create these safe workspaces where people have a sense of belonging, value, and shared mutual commitment. And the work is based off of my PhD, which is in global leadership and entrepreneurship. And I had my dissertation in group dynamics with an emphasis on cohesion, which is hence why I was able to release the best-selling title, Cohesion Culture, Proven Principles to Retain Your Top Talent. And that serves as the basis for all of the work that I do. Brilliant. So obviously, um, it's funny, actually, just on that, uh, just made me think when you said uh, West Virginia there, um, the, the dulcet tones of Olivia Newton-John popped in my head singing uh, <laughs> Country Roads. So they, it's just the, the first thing that popped in my mind. Um, I was a big fan of her when I was younger. Um, so, so we will go down rabbit holes, no doubt. Um, That's okay. One of the things uh, that obviously, um, I, as I've said to you before in our little chat, uh, when uh, I saw uh, uh, you and I saw your um, your expertise in, in talent retention and the point where we are now, we're recording this now in May 2022 for the listeners and uh, viewers there. Obviously, there's lots and lots of stuff in social media, lots of stuff around, around the uh, great resignation as it's being coined. I know um, a couple of days ago in the UK, whilst we've got, um, uh, there's a lot of things about um, cost of living, uh, some figures came up that, that the um, employment rates were a 48 year low or something like that. And I'm guessing similar sort of things are happening um, around the world at different points, maybe maybe different countries, different things. But there is a, a, the, 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 two, the pandemic that we've all hopefully um, uh, well on the way out of now has created a lot of change in what is expected from an employer 
and what is expected as an and what employees want. I said in, in recent weeks in the UK, I've seen um, multiple um, uh, areas around the, the the British government talking about getting people back into the into offices. Um, people like Alan Sugar saying that people are lazy for not working on a in, in the summer in I can't remember it was Goldman Sachs or one of the one of the big ones. Uh, quite quite a few clickbait head, headline grabbers, I think, in some cases. But it seems to be uh, this topic of the change in the workplace and the change in the what we expect as employees and what employers are. Some are grasping and running with, and some are a little slower to jump at. So, getting you on to talk about this. Um, and I should shut up a little bit in a minute, um, is is um, is great. And it's kind of, do you just want to talk about, because I, I know you mentioned that. Yeah. Th this is it's not something that you just dreamt up a couple of days ago. It's something that you've been um, passionate about and working through for many, many years. Yeah, I saw the, the trends back in 2019 when I released the book. I saw the trends that there was very little information out there about talent retention. There was a lot of information about how you might train an individual or the talent acquisition part and all those, but very little uh, pieces of literature was really around how do organizations keep the talent. It's almost as though they were very content with a revolving door or an open back door philosophy that they would focus all their energies on bringing people in, but they would run through them. They would fizzle through those individuals or, or let them leave. And I felt that that's a tremendous expense to an organization to do that. And why not, if you're going to spend the time wooing somebody to come to your organization, why wouldn't you consider them top talent and do everything you can do to keep them? And so philosophically, there's several things here that I wanna unpack from your entry comments into this conversation. One is, I don't think it's the great resignation, which was really fine and I understand why it was created, but it's now the recalibration. So I speak about it being the great recalibration because what it really happened is those individuals last year, 48 million people quit their jobs, but they didn't stay home and eat potato chips and stream their favorite shows on some uh, platform, some streaming platform. What they did is they said, I want to reinvent where I do work and how I do it. Yeah. And so now you have organizations who have to figure out how to keep up with that. And what the pandemic did was it trained people, it trained companies. As a matter of fact, you can go back and historically look that most organizations in those two years set records for the money that that organization made, for the success that, that organization made. And those individuals were not in the current workplace. Now, I wanna make sure that anyone listening understands. I think that it's important for the organization to decide where work could be done and how it could be done. But I don't believe it's a hard line. I do believe that there is an opportunity for flexibility in it. And that's what we know is needed. Today's marketplace, one of the key expectations is what we refer to as this entrepreneurial spirit, yeah. which means that the individual wants to have flexibility in where they work, the locations, how they work. They want to have specific autonomy they want to know what their role in their job is, and they want to be free to go do it. They don't want somebody standing over top of them. They want leaders who will manage the work they do, not the time they're in the seat. And so what we're also seeing is we're fighting against this sort of idea that the only way we can have culture is if we bring everybody under the same roof. Well, I have a philosophical view about that. And what I say, and also the other thing is, if we don't bring them under the same roof, we have to pay them enough money. We have to woo them with money. And I will say this, if you have to buy the talent, you will continue to buy the talent. And yeah. for me, yeah. culture is a result of how you treat people, not the treats you give them. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I think it, uh, it's, it's interesting what, what you say there is, is that um, people might arrive for money, there's a, a certain level that people will expect and, and kind of um, grass is always greener. But as you say, it's the that opportunity to develop, that opportunity to make a difference, that opportunity to be your own person is, well, is Nigel, so important. Nigel, let's, yeah, Nigel, let's face it. People have 
have left organizations for money for centuries, right? It's not something brand new that just started this year or the last couple of years. No. But the data does not support that that's the primary reason people are leaving. As a matter of fact, there was an MIT Sloan report that was just done by these three uh, key re researchers. And what they did is they reviewed 35 million online profiles of individuals who left a job and identified why they left. Number one, they quit the supervisor. Oh, yeah. They left the company because of how they were treated or mistreated. Yeah. That's still the number one reason. Pay was number 16 on the list. So if you stop and, and you want to say, oh, people are leaving because they're getting more money and they're going here. Well, it's an opportunistic environment. That's what capitalism is. It's opportunistic. So if you go to find a better job and better income, then that's fine. But what stimulates people to leave is how they're treated within the organization or how they're mistreated within the organization. So part of my role is to guide leaders to infuse this concept of cohesion into their into their cultures so that they can change toxic cultures. See, that's why there's 34 million people left. They left because it was a toxic culture. They didn't feel like they were connected with their supervisor. They didn't have any opportunity for advancement. And by the way, 63% of all people in organizations seek growth development and advancement. And the other 37% wanted to, they're just not as vocal about it as the other 63%. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so, and, and also, whether or not the, the individual had the resources to do the job that they wanted. So, so those are things that created this toxic environment that they left. So those 34 million people actually put up with toxic environments for a long time before they finally decided to leave. And what happened with the pandemic is instead of people being limited by a geographic area, we are now no longer limited by four walls. So individuals who may have been able to only think of working at a company that was in a homogenous community where they lived could now through the internet expand outside of their four walls and go elsewhere. And so we saw a lot of movement for that. We also found that when leaders were very hard pressed to say, if you don't come back into the office, we're not treating you like that employee. We're only going to promote people who are sitting in the seats. All of those leaders who may have thought they were grabbing attention grabbed it in the wrong way. Yeah. They have all backpedaled. Most of all those, those stories have all backpedaled from, from doing it. I have found very few leaders who have held firm to that. What I do believe is that leaders within the organization should be flexible and they should think about if work can be done in different locations, then they should figure out how to make it happen. It's just simple as that. It's not up to the employee to say, look, I don't want to work. You know, I don't want to sit in the seat. I want to work from home. And the company says, well, I appreciate that, but you can't do that because that work has to be done here. And the person says, well, then I'm going to quit. That's fine. But they're not quitting because that, uh, that company won't create a uh, remote option for them. It's that the remote option that they want isn't available. Yeah. It's no different than if, hey, the job I want to do is sell peanuts and what, I'm, what you're actually producing is something other than peanuts and you go like, well, then I have to go to another job. Okay, so you go to another job and you do that. It's, so that's really what we're seeing in this, what I refer to as that great recalibration. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, before we move on, I just got someone at my door asking for their phone to be unlocked. Um, which I thought I'd already done, apologies. No problem. Problems of teenagers. Um, and I could have done it while talking to you if I hadn't put my phone up there. Because then <laughs> I'd have to reach across and it would just, I couldn't surreptitiously do it. Um, apologies again. Come on. So my eldest is looking after the little one. So, because my wife's out tonight. Right, back in the room. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so I'm just trying to think of the last bit that you just said then. 
Um, I talked, I referred to it. I wrapped everything up around the great recalibration. That was it, yeah. So with this recalibration, as you describe it, I, really, I, I think I like, I like the comment. It's kind of just moving in some ways moving the pieces around it's like one of those little games isn't it with all that with the nine the eight tiles in the nine holes in some ways and and, and I, I do think it's it's um the hybrid working thing i suppose that you've got a number of things that will make people think they would want to leave but it's not hard as you say it's not big enough for them to go right i'm going to up sticks and move to another city to another country and as you say that flex now so those things that are it, it, it's it's weighing up those pros and cons isn't it and that that barrier to leaving is as reduced with the the companies that are making those remote roles available um are being flexible and i think that i i'm I, my own personal uh, situation in my company is very very strong very forward thinking on things like this um and I actually saw something the other day and I, I put a, a note saying it is kind of some organizations and historically we've got this and it's still there is, is kind of the dark satanic mills approach of if I can't see you working, you're not working. And it it's all about trust. But the thing is, there will be people who are no good at working at home. They will go home, they will work from home, and they will be not as productive as they are in the office. But there are also people who will be working from home and not be very productive, and they would not be very productive in the office, but they would be visible. And therefore, people wouldn't realize they weren't being productive. Because it kind of goes to that point now where you have this the remote working is that the output is what you see. And that is what you that's all you see. And and it's kind of like you go notwithstanding a few video calls and things and if and that's easier to focus on the output being there and not being blinded by the person being there and going oh yeah they're all right, right. they're in every day they're bang on time uh, and it and it comes about around about getting that person who gives that does that work and does that work well and i always talk about performance management being sorry management of poor performance not performance management because that's all another topic that's that you another. could that's another topic for another yeah, day. Yeah, that's a long topic to talk about. But but poor performance management is something that most organizations sit there and go, right, um, um, let's just make a blanket rule for everyone to stop these things that we're seeing happening. Because that's easier than dealing with and identifying the in the small number, the minority who are performing poorly. Because it makes it hard that the train you've got to train the managers properly. You've got to train. You've got to set the expectations of what you want from someone in their outputs. Whereas if you just do a blanket thing of you've got to be in at nine and you're not allowed to leave at five until five, and then you can see what they're doing, it makes it easier to manage. That. Absolutely, that's that's exactly where the conversation is coming from, and it's been somewhat shielded by the concept of saying, but our culture will be eroded if we don't bring everybody back together. But the reality is, it's like I said before, the culture is about how you treat people. It's not whether people are all under the same roof or not. Yeah. So your culture is a combination of your rituals, your traditions, your customs. It's your language, it's your symbols. All those things create the culture, not only for what we have in society, but it's the same thing for work. And realistically, it's taking a look and challenging ourselves to say, how can we do this today? And yeah. what can we get from making this sort of paradigm shift? Um, and are we using the technology that's available to us to really make it happen? I mean, when the pandemic occurred, it was a crisis management decision. I mean, many organizations simply had employees unplug their computers, pack them up in their car, take them home and figure out a spot at home where they can reset. Uh, but if you're more forward thinking, you're starting to evolve the, that process and you're evolving it to, you know, the different types of technology and the software that's available. And you can track whether people are being productive or not being productive. But what we're seeing in the workforce is they want to be managed based on the work that's being done or the quality of the work, the completed work, 
not on how long it took them to do yeah. it. I agree. And it is really just a mindset change. And for organizational leaders who sort of fight that, they're going to be in a struggle to retain their talent because that talent will then be forced to go elsewhere. And if you start penalizing people because they're not in the office, then you're not appealing to the fact that people want growth development and advancement. And all of the work around diversity, equity, and inclusion how does all of that stand up if you're now going to marginalize a person who works remotely against a person who's in the office? I mean, there's just all these things don't really make sense for organizations to take that type of an approach. So part of the work that I do when working with leaders is to help them assess the culture within their organization, allow them to take the strategic framework of cohesion which is belonging, value, and shared mutual commitment, and lay it over top of their company so that they can see the areas where they might need to make some changes. When it comes to belonging, it's not just whether a person feels like they fit in, because some people can fake it to fit in. It's a matter of the fact that they believe that where they're working is a special place. They, they promote it. They tell people they're proud of where they work. And they're also included. So the belonging part not only says, do I feel like this is a special place where I'm working and I'll promote and talk about it, but I've been included. Yeah. So to make this sense to those people listening, it's kind of like this. If I invite you to a party, then you have a sense of belonging because, hey, I'm with the cool kids. I got an invitation to the party. But you don't truly believe that you fully belong until when you get to the party, I make sure that you know where the food is. If there's music, I get you up on the dance floor. So the party invitation is the first part of belonging. The engagement of you in the party is now the inclusion. Yeah, and Simon yeah. Sinek tells us, he says that, you know, it's, it's really, it's unnatural to have this sense of belonging, but it's available in all cultures. And I've had the privilege of traveling to over 60 countries. And I will tell you that in these cultures, people want to feel connected to something. It's part of our inherent DNA. We want to belong. We want to affiliate. We want to make sure that we're with someone who has the similar thinkings that we do. That's not uncommon. There, what's uncommon is that when people isolate themselves, that's an anomaly. That's an outlier. Yeah. But for the most of us, we do want to interact with people. And we can interact either personally, and we have a lot of preferences of personal interaction, but there is a lot of individuals who can interact through some sort of technology. I mean, I'll give you in this example. My wife and I will be married 45 years this coming Saturday. We started our relationship. Oh, thank you. We started our relationship on the phone because we didn't live in the same community. We didn't go to the same school, and we were on the phone every night. We have that we use technology 45 years ago yeah. to create a relationship that has lasted this long. So for me, I'm sort of like, you know, you got you to gotta cut some break here on whether or not you think you can yeah. make this happen. Yeah, I think, I, think it, I was going to say people confuse um, difficulty in maintaining a relationship with it not being possible. It might be Correct. you've got to work at it harder about it. You've got to think. It's like running an online meeting. Yeah, It's not as easy as controlling a meeting when you've got everyone in the room. But because yes. it takes more to think about it, you've got to think about what you're doing. And again, it's again, it's a bit like that poor performance management. It's about thinking about what you're going to do. And like you say, you would have been making yourself available, going to the, maybe you had a phone or maybe you had to go down to a, a, a phone box somewhere. Because I know that's kind of what it's like in some cases where yeah. you do that and you'd have a long distance phone call to build that relationship stood in a freezing cold um, thing. But that's harder. It's a much easier way to do it. Absolutely. But it can be done. Yeah. And, and we, and we. Well, I hope you enjoyed that first part of the interview with Dr. Troy. Um, come back next time for more chat about talent retention. Speak to you If you enjoyed the show, um, it would be brilliant if you uh, would like to support it. A uh, number of ways you can do that. Number one is sharing it with your friends and colleagues. Uh, the more people who hear about it, the more people 
uh, get to uh, get the experience from my fantastic guests. If you want to go a bit more than that, you can jump onto wherever you listen to this and give me a review. Five stars would be lovely. And if you want to look at throwing some cash towards me, there are a number of ways you can do that. You can pop along to the Patreon slash Sunday Lunch PM uh, there. Or you could grab one of the books that I've published over the years and uh, obviously get a little bit of cash from those. On the website under the shop, there under, sorry, yeah, under the shop, I've got links to all of my guests, previous guests' books. And Ian Joel's is on there. And if you jump along to there, you can uh, buy a copy of their books and I get a little kickback from that too. And obviously, with our new headline sponsor of Tamplo, popping along, signing up, and if you end up using it, I will get a kickback there as well. So, uh, finally, obviously, as I say every time, uh, the most important thing, though, is come back next time. I'll speak to you soon. Cheers. Well, it's goodbye from me, Nigel Creaser, and it's goodbye from him, the Sunday Lunch PM. Goodbye.